There it is. Okay. Got it. Good. Ask and it shall be given unto you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so I've been looking at the uh, book of Romans the last uh, last number of weeks, and uh, we uh, we're we're at chapter five today. If if you're familiar with the book of Romans, it's a um, it's a theological treatise, if you will, of Paul that he's describing to the people of Rome and the people in that area who will uh, read his letter um, what he believes the gospel to be. And, and then when it gets to the end of chapter 8, it, uh, it goes into three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, about the fate of the Jewish people and, uh, and his concern for his own race at that particular time. And then it goes from chapter 12 to 16, talking about some practical things that we can do uh, in, in our life. But at this particular point, um, we are uh, looking at chapter 5. Let me give you a quick summary of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Paul says, I am eager to preach the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation revealed to all mankind in the beauty of creation. Chapter 2, he says, We know all people sin because we judge one another, and if we judge others, we're probably doing the same thing they're doing, and yet God loves us all. It doesn't matter who we are, so we ought to stop judging one another. And then in verse chapter 3, he says, Let me be clear. There's no one person or group that has an advantage over others, especially not even the Jews who call themselves you know, the chosen people. For salvation comes as a gift from God, not based on how we live out the law, but on how much God loves us all. We have no reason to boast in ourselves in what we have done or what we will do. That leaves us in darkness except for God's provision for us, he says in chapter 4. And that is a provision of faith, like Abraham, like David. So salvation comes to us by our faith in what God has done. Not by our faith, but by our faith in what God has done, his grace, his gift. So chapter 5 reiterates this justified by faith kind of feeling. We have all been, or at least shall be, justified by faith. And by that, we gain peace with God. Jesus brought this our way, he will say, by dying on the cross while we were still sinners. So salvation, gaining peace with God, is a gift from God not something we can earn so grace might flourish. So here it is, verse 1 of chapter 5. Again, my words of uh, trying to understand Paul and how can you say, make him more clear, but uh, I, I feel like I need to do that. Consequently, through our belief in Jesus the Messiah, we can have confidence that God has given us our first lesson of faith allowing us to know with all confidence about his extensive love for us. What joy we have to know that he welcomes us into his family. As our faith in God's love increases, we understand how he helps us withstand the difficult times that come our way in life because he teaches us that these experiences will make us stronger, able to patiently work through things and ultimately become mature in the ways of God. This maturity helps us know the love of God deeply in our hearts and sense the presence of his spirit surrounding us. So, little commentary on that, if you will. We believe in, in God's love, and we learn that difficult experiences in this life make us stronger. The, the scriptures, the way we're used to hearing it, say 
perseverance produces proven character and proven character produces hope. Well, proven character is becoming Christ-like when we become people who live like Jesus. And that character produces a hope within us, which is an attitude of expectation and confidence that God will come through. Hope, Paul says, does not disappoint. We have confidence in the midst of the unknown of our life because God's on our side. We have confidence that God has never yet failed us. In Psalm 22, it says that in thee our fathers trusted. They trusted and were not disappointed. So we can be confident that God is going to be with us. Confident of this fact that Paul says in another place, he who began a good work within us will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. So God is still working in our life. And even in the midst of the difficult times, no matter how difficult it gets, Paul turns around uh, and, and says that it's a momentary light affliction. I mean, that, there are days that I don't think what I'm going through is a momentary light affliction. But that's the way Paul looks at it in comparison, he says, to the eternal weight of glory. Compared to what we're going to enjoy there, what we <clears throat> suffer here is momentary and light. See, it gives us a new perspective. Remember the story of uh, Peter getting out of the boat and walking on the water and doing just fine until he took his eyes off Jesus and turned to the storm itself. And how many times we turn to our storm and we miss the eyes of Jesus right there, holding us and keeping us afloat, keeping us walking on whatever water seems to be uh, before us. So God is asking us in this passage of scripture, I think, to see tribulations as really a new adventure. What's God doing in this new thing that's happening in my life? How is he molding me or how is he helping others? And maybe, maybe he's just asking me to carry on, if you will, Jesus' suffering on the cross to help others. And so I have to go through a difficult time so someone else can see the glory of God at work, the faith that I have, the way that God cares for his loved ones. Paul says in Romans 11, God is at work in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. And we lay our lives before him and ask him to use us for his glory. Going on in chapter 5, verse 6. Keep this in mind. We have no possible right to a relationship with God. But he came to earth in his chosen one, Jesus, and died to pay the price for our ungodly sin. People might choose to die for a good friend, but it does not happen often that a person would choose to die to save the life of another. But God chose to help us understand the depth of his love by dying on the cross in our place while we were still full of our sinfulness. Verse 9, he says, We could say we have been saved from the eternal consequences of our sins because Jesus paid the price for our redemption. We were God's enemies because of our own sin. But now we have been welcomed into his house because Jesus called us friends and brought us into the family. I praise God. Jesus has opened up the way for us to become friends with God, who is our heavenly father. And then in verse 12, he says, All mankind has sinned, just like the first man, Adam, and through our sin, we deserve to be dead. The law makes it clear. Everyone has sinned, but without the law, we could not truly understand what sin was. And being punished for doing what one does not know is wrong does not make sense. 
So all people were destined to die because Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. Yet God had another, like Adam, Paul says, to come to our rescue. I think it's interesting in this passage of Scripture that Jesus died for us when we were in four different descriptions of our condition. Verse 6, we were helpless, couldn't do it on our own power. Verse 6 also says we were ungodly. No matter how good we think we are, we were ungodly without Jesus. Unable in our current state to admit that we even needed help. Verse 8 says, we were still sinners. And, and I love this picture that God loved me and came and initiated salvation for me when I didn't want him to be a part of my life. But he knew it was best. And I just think so often of the people around me and, and many times in my life, because I've always thought I was right, uh, where, where I've looked around and I've said, well, they need to apologize to me. Wow. What if God said that to me? Ed, I'll come help you as soon as you apologize. No. He died on the cross while I was still in my state of sinfulness. I love the, love the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. There's a verse in there that says, My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross. It is well, it is well with my soul. And then verse 10 says, to make it even worse, he died while we were enemies of God. I can think of lots of people in this world who don't really wouldn't call themselves an enemy of God. They would call themselves, I don't really want to believe in God, I don't really want to spend time with God, that kind of thing. But they wouldn't say, I'm an enemy of God, I'm, I'm fighting against him. But there are people that are fighting against him. And that's the way we're described, as enemies of God. But verse 6 says, at the right time, God demonstrated his love to us, reached out to us who were completely estranged from him, and showed his love to us. I wonder if that might be a great definition of love in some ways. Love demonstrates the unexpected at the least expected moment. When you expect it the least, God does something unexpected in your life. And that's his love. I wonder how we might be able to do that for those around us. Love one another as I have loved you, Scripture says. So, one way of looking at it is, is we don't have to straighten ourselves out before we come to Christ. He's not expecting us to be perfect when we get there. He's expecting us to come. The other way of looking at it is, is that maybe then we shouldn't be expecting others to be perfect in their life around us. And when they interact with us in ways that we don't think are right, maybe we need to be able to give them some slack, to love them the way God loves us. All right, verse 15 of chapter 5 says, Not that I am equating the gift of God with the sin of Adam, but if the choice of Adam to sin caused all mankind to be cursed with death, and separation from God, then the choice of Jesus, the Messiah, to die brought about forgiveness of sin and restoration of mankind with God. So we get this parallel between Adam and Christ. 
16, he goes on and he says, think of it this way, because of Adam's sin, judgment came to mankind and we were condemned to death. Yet, by God's grace, salvation came to mankind and our sins were forgiven. 17, he says, one sinned and consequently death reigned. So also one conquered death, Jesus, the Messiah, and many will reign in life because of that act of God's abundant grace. The free gift. Adam's transgression led to bondage. Jesus released us from that bondage. Adam's sin brought judgment, brought condemnation to every man, and Jesus re removes that condemnation. Verse chapter eight, verse one of chapter eight of Romans, we'll see there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So Jesus set us free from the bondage, removed the condemnation, forgave our sins, and gifted us eternal life, all by grace. Verse eighteen, Paul goes on to say, I'm going to say it a few more times. The one act in the Garden of Eden brought condemnation to everyone, and the one act of righteousness through Jesus gave everyone the opportunity to be restored with God. Again, through Adam's disobedience, mankind became separated from God, but through Jesus' obedience, through Adam's disobedience, mankind became separated. Through Jesus' obedience, Many have been restored to righteousness. Verse 20, the law of God given to Moses brought the awareness of sin. And as the sin increased, grace of God increased as well. Sin reigned as long as death was the only option. Yet grace now brings to people another option, eternal life through our Lord, the Messiah. <clears throat> he's going to move on to chapter 6 and say now you have a choice but we're not there yet so I want to encourage you to see any tribulation that comes your way as a new adventure something new that God is doing don't know why he always does that but I do know that from this passage of scripture, it is good for us to go through difficult times. Not that I want them, but I know he's molding me and helping others. And I do know that we are set free from the bondage of sin. We do not have to sin any longer question really comes back to why do we still sin because we still live within our old habits we could choose not to sin and every opportunity before us we have that choice problem is, is our habits are so well ingrained within us that we almost like and feel comfortable doing the same old thing rather than trying something new I just encourage you, every time tribulation comes your way, say, God, what do you have for me in this? What can I do here? And any time a temptation comes your way that you recognize, then recognize you have a choice and you do not have to fall into the old habit. You have the freedom to say no. All by grace. God has given that to us. We're going to fail. We're going to struggle. We're, going to, we're, we're not going to do it right every time. But God is asking us to try to choose to follow him every step of the way. In his name, amen. I want us to 